So hi folks, uh, Alex Forrest logging to you. Now this is something of a provocative title, you know, <laughs> how to disappoint people. But it came about because uh, I got hold of a, a book I, as a you know part of my education to the wonderful world of women and dating. I tend to graze on Amazon, and uh, I found this this book. A little bit of a cheesy photograph. What w women want in a man. How to become the alpha male women respect, desire, and want to submit to, by Bruce Bryans. Uh, fantastic, yeah. You're going to think this is thought, you know, full of all sorts of alpha male nonsense that you could well do without in your life. There's enough of it uh, swinging around um, without this gentleman adding to the pile. However, however, with some uh, sort of humility, having to sort of doff my intellectual cap of arrogance and put it to one side, I've read a couple of these and I've started to think that this guy has something really interesting to say. And what's interesting is that I was immediately put off by the cover and the title. But I mean, you, you've got to put that sort of photograph on a book in order to generate sales, you know, in order for someone to go to the bottom of that page on Amazon and actually click through to buy the book. And uh, the, the chapter that I found most interesting, and it's like a, a book that's sort of filled with little gems amongst the rock, little, you know, you can, you can mine them and you should mine them. You shouldn't, as he says himself in the book, you shouldn't take things at face value. But if something particularly chimes with you as you're reading a book, and what better, what other activity could there be in your life right now during a period of international lockdown, um, you should, you know, uh, just uh, extract, if you like, in a selective way, what what connects with you, what relates to you right now, yeah, you know, and you'll feel it in there. And I rec I couldn't sleep the other night, and I got up at 5.30 and I started to read this this book. And that's quite a good time, because the sort of the intellectual cri critic is asleep. Well, you know, you're asleep virtually at 5.30 in the morning. It's quite a healthy state of mind in order to take on fresh knowledge and consider it in a, you know, a, what's the word, um, in a way that, you know, you're not immediately, you're, you're, your critical voice isn't immediately jumping in and making um, snap judgments. Now, this was all going to tie in happily by the end of this vlog, so stay tuned. Because uh, this concept of disappointment and me actually encouraging you to go out there and disappoint uh, people has a really interesting um, message. And it is also a current message. Uh, yes, it has resonance for what is happening in the world at the moment. Now, you know, what does he mean by disappointing people? Obviously, he means being able to say no and not being afraid of the reaction you get when you do say no. And that's when you kind of feel something in here that's really quite important to you and you're awake and conscious enough to hear the voice. And when someone says, you know, well, forget about it, mate, come out to the pub, have a few beers, you know, being on the wagon for a month, what's that nonsense? You know, let's say you've decided to give up liquor for a, for a, for a month. And that, um, that voice in there is saying no, um, but you don't want to disappoint your buddies. So that's just one little illustration, and I'll give more at the end of this vlog, of the way in which you're kind of being congruent with yourself, you're being true to yourself, if only because a month ago you resolved to give up alcohol. Nothing wrong with alcohol, but you made a resolution to give it up, and now you, you must say no, and you must disappoint people. A small, uh, um, you know, a, a little illustration of the point. Now I've got a bigger illustration of the point um, from my own life and that I think has, as I say, resonance with the current situation. And that is an experience 15 years ago when I went and did, probably actually 20 years ago, I did a MBA, a business course at a you know internationally renowned business school called Cranfield. Uh, it was very expensive, and uh, it, it was a lot of high-powered people there. And we had this, we had all the sorts of normal stuff that you have on business schools. And then we had this one weekend where we were shuttled off 
to a hotel in the middle of nowhere, all a hundred odd of us, and it was part of an organisational behaviour module, which, you know, it wasn't accounting, wasn't legal, wasn't business, wasn't economics, all the sorts of normal topics where you sit in front of a teacher and he chirps away and you take notes like a DD student and you ask little questions. No, we were taken away for a weekend that was completely different from anything that we had experienced. We were piled into a big room and the session was just, the weekend was to start at 10 o'clock. There we sat. Okay, we chit-chatted, this was some late comers. Looked at our watches, it was 10 past 10. It's unlike an internationally renowned business school to, uh, you know, for the tutors to be late. Anyway, we, we, we gave it no further thought, got a coffee, da di da, 20 past 10. Now, 25 past 10, going through the half hour mark, we, there were some rumblings in the room. What on earth was going on? Where were the, uh, the staff? Where were the tutors? Um, we knew that they must be around because they delivered a sale on the Friday night and told us to come to the first session um, on the Saturday morning at 10. Now here's what, what, here's what happened. You had a bunch of people who were like, this is kind of crazy, we should just do something constructive, uh, either go to our rooms and do some private study, uh, um, and, but certainly it's, it's a waste of precious time, particularly when, when you're taught about time management on a executive MBA to be sitting in a room like Muppets. And in fact, it's quite discourteous. So you had that one group, and then you had the other group who were, well, no, um, this is part of something bigger. Uh, we should wait and see how things unfold. Uh, in fact, perhaps somehow what is happening now is, you know, the organisational behavioural teaching at work. Anyway, uh, what happened is you cr these, these factions were created. It hardly mattered what side of the argument you were. Both were persuasive um, in their own ways. But what was interesting was that one group started to get bigger and actually people stood up and there was a point at which uh, there was like 70 people on one side of the hall and 30 people on the other. I mean, I can't even remember which group was which. Um, and you could see people uh, flaking and running over to the bigger group. And eventually it was like three or four, five of us. <laughs> now, because I was in the smaller group. Now you can imagine the huge pressure that there was to, you know, bail. And I'm, I'm, to my shame, I actually bailed and I went over to the bigger group. I kind of kidded myself that it was for a certain, you know, intellectually sound um, reason, but at heart, what was going on was I was a, a victim, if you like, um, or a willing participant in the idea of the herd, yeah? Uh, the idea that, uh, in truth, uh, we seek the protection of the group. I mean, even to the point, presumably, of, you know, like lemmings jumping over a cliff. I mean, I guess that's what that metaphor is saying. Now, that herd has some merit, doesn't it? I mean, a lot of merit. Um, but you can see situations where the views of the herd could be irrational. Um, and um, could be short-sighted, groupthink. What was going on was not an exercise in trying to um, reason out what was the best course of action or where your principles lay. It was, you know, it was simply a case of whether or not you could um, withstand the pressure of the majority. And you know, at the end of the day, all these clever little arguments and discussions and people having views and opinions and prejudices and so on, the end of the day, people on the whole, pretty much wholesale, tend to go, go with the herd uh, point of view. It's what's interesting about uh, the current situation is that, you know, um, wherever you stand on this particular argument, what's so interesting is one side of the argument just has not been given any airtime. 
And, and I think you probably agree with me, even if you are kind of on the fence or on the other side of the argument. It's like we all know that a lot of the data is completely unreliable. We all know that there's a little bit of a um, kind of a huge amount of smoke from like a matchstick amount of fire um, to a point. We, 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 we all kind of know that um, something is kind of going, there's something odd going on. Um, and yet, we just feel we have to go with the general view. Um, and we listen to the general view. Now, we don't listen to it in a, a room full of people, like I described on that business um, weekend. But it's a similar thing, isn't it? Just in a, in a, in a, on a smaller scale. Now, there's this massive uh, means of, of, of communication between people um, that's been um, completely kind of it's like the, the, the Pandora's box, if you like, your uh, classical references, has been opened and out has come all sorts of good and evil things. Do you know what I mean? And I think this is, um, I think this is for me one of the you know, most critical learning. Um, um, notes the, the most important thing to, to be taking away from the current situation. As I say, not necessarily what side of the fence, what side of the argument you're on. You know, you'll know which side of the argument I'm on, but that's irrelevant for the po point of illustrating what I'm trying to say. Um, the point is, how, isn't it very extremely interesting how little airtime, the kind of the mavericks, the outsiders, and it's also interesting how they've been painted as crackpots um, it, uh, and they've been marginalized and there's no truth in it there's no sort of factual basis in it uh, what is in it is the fear in the herd yeah and in order to keep the herd together I'm afraid you do have to uh, squash the mavericks um, who, you know, who've got rather a different take on the situation. I mean, you know, many of the most... Pr I mean, I could give you a, a classical um, reference, or not a classical Renaissance reference, in Galileo. He was, he, was, he was seriously persecuted, you know, by the Roman Catholic Church for his belief that the Earth moved round the Sun, not the other way around. He was a right royal outsider. He was an alien in the society at the time, and his views were... Um, not did not suit the uh, you know the views promulgated by the Roman Catholic deeply heavily Christianized um, world European world at least at, at that time. I'm going to tell you another little story, which is I had a similar thing happen uh, a few years later where I I did a sort like a self improvement weekend. I had a friend um, and she persuaded me to come along to this weekend with her. And this was a bit weird. This is the landmark forum. And uh, the weekend was really exceptional in terms of its insights about what drives us as human beings. And as a writer, um, you know, I, it was fascinating about how things that happened to you in childhood uh, clearly drive the decisions you make in adulthood. And it, it was all good. It was a bit touchy feely. But what was, it was a great weekend. And after the weekend, there was a Tuesday night where everybody was invited to come back to, well, we didn't quite know what, celebrate the, you know, the achievement of surviving the weekend. And the lady, her name was Sophie, she was French, she was a very confident, strong woman who presented, um, basically sweated us all out. It was in a hotel in um, Kings, just near Kings Cross. And it was an American organization. And it, was, it just became really weird because this was like, you know, self-improvement, self-development, Scientology stuff. And, you know, it, it, it was, it, what, what they did is she kind of gave us a speech and then she said, right, okay. And we noticed that during the course of the kind of, there were even some presentations where people came up and said how, 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 how useful they'd found it and how, how it's clearly going to transform their lives. I was just kind of curious. I wasn't wanting to sign up the landmark forum for life in fact I already signed up to a to a cult the school of philosophy which is actually not a cult at all it's just a lovable uh, vehicle for trans for um, learning meditation and learning um, a little bit of Indian scripture 
but um, so I was already, you know, I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't kind of like needing a, a Scientology-like outfit to sort my head out. Um, anyway, we saw these trestle tables being set up around the room with little, back in the day, the credit card swipe um, machines. And we all knew something was coming. There were probably, again, there were about 100, 150 of us in this room. And the point came when Sophie said, right, okay, so you've, you all agree you've had a fantastic weekend, you got so much out of it, now's the chance to sign up. And, and she sweated us out. And um, about 80 people kind of immediately went to the trestle tables and did the right thing and signed up to further courses. And then there was whatever, 70, but quickly diminished to about 50 or perhaps 40 of us who were there again. I was again in the minority group. Um, I was with a, a really lovely girl actually, and not dating, I just met on the, on, on the weekend. And uh, but anyway, so uh, she then, started to give us some aggro. She had the microphone. It's quite powerful if you've got a microphone and nobody else has, unless you ask to go up to the, 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 um, the stage and actually take the microphone, which is quite a brave and bold decision. Um, and, and she said, you know, she just, she, she just waited. She understood this principle of, of her dynamics and she knew that if she just waited and did nothing and sort of tapped her uh, stilettoed tip of her shoe, on the stage and said one or two things eventually we'd break and uh but i'd wised up by that point and i i mean and it was just proper weird and uh and i stood up and i said can i take the microphone and she battered me down she said no it's too late for that and uh, quite a sharp voice actually it's interesting it doesn't matter if you're reasonable or rational once you've got the herd singing to the tune that you want them to sing to yeah it's extremely difficult so it's quite a lot of courage to break through that i remember uh, but but i was kind of i, I had uh, the antidote i had had the, had the immunity from the cranfield mba experience everything is acquired knowledge and experience I don't think people are inherently courage uh, inherently courageous or inherently cowardly um so, and I remember look, looking around at this girl and I felt like, felt like that silly scene in the Titanic where Kate Winslet's um, lets go of whatever his name is and he, he disappears into the deep dark death depths and, and um, she's lost him forever. And, and I just walked out of the hall and that was it, I know, I know, you know. What on earth does this have to do with women and dating? I, if you haven't already, you know, surfed away from this vlog, um, you'll be asking that question. I think that, you know, as a guy who wants to get a handle on this area of your life, uh, you will uh, often find yourself, and I think this is sort of a, this is a vlog for guys who have traveled quite a long distance in terms of learning about skills, mm. social skills, how to meet and to date, and approach and meet and date women, is that you might have got to this stage, this kind of plateau, where you are maybe, in a sort of second or third date situation, maybe with two, three, maybe four girls, and maybe you've um, slept with one of them, or perhaps quite, quite possibly you might not have done, but you might have, you know, kissed, and she's given you some, you know, very positive single uh, signals, and you feel as if you've done all this hard work over the last months or years, yeah, of learning how to uh, be socially smart with a girl, how to flirt. Um, how to play the dance, um, how to be good on the date, how to um, seduce, uh, and so on and so forth. And you're like, you know, you find yourself in this sort of plateau, and it's particularly, you know, painful. And you spend uh, your idle moments, you know, looking at your phone to check, uh, you know, what time she last looked at her WhatsApp. Um, and and I guess the you know the answer you will already know the answer which is you know to go out there and kiss more frogs frankly and that is an extremely uh, important thing for guys to learn yeah you really do have to i'm afraid just play a little bit of a numbers game i mean it's just an, it, one of these inconvenient truths i mean i i, I spent 15 perhaps 20 years playing a, a, a you know a serial monogamous um, you know, friend zone-ish numbers game, just one line. But you've got to get, you know, you've got to get three or four or five 
um, irons in the fire, particularly if you're an older dude, yeah? Because you both need to get some practice, to learn some skills, to become good, relaxed, and comfortable around women. And, and you know, it's just a simple statistical thing, isn't it? If you meet three or four different five girls, you can make a better choice about which one you're genuinely interested in. You'll be more relaxed in making that decision and then acting on it. Anyway, that's all, you know, incredibly, incredibly important. So please take what I'm about to say with a pinch of salt. But I think there is also, you know, underlying it, um, this kind of inner um, issue of uh, being able, being prepared to disappoint people, being prepared to say no, um, and being prepared to take heat, you know, just like uh, I took uh, heat on that business MBA. So look, look, I should just try and tie this up and wrap up. I think what, you know, what is going on is, you know, you could become a brilliant tennis player or a brilliant uh, golf player, let's say. But it's funny how, you know, there are some standout guys who win all the championships in the tournament, certainly in tennis. And, and yet, you kind of think that they're all extremely talented and kind of, you know, on a level playing field in terms of their skills. So I think guys who kind of acquired a level of skills nevertheless somehow need to go the extra distance. I mean, you probably enjoyed uh, quite a fun adventure to date. I mean, it's no shame in being the runner-up of uh, a Grand Slam tennis tournament, for God's sake, uh, to keep things in proportion. But it's just a, it's just a metaphor, just an analogy. But um, the, the point is that there's something else, isn't there? And I just wonder whether that something else isn't this uh, ability of a man to, uh, to disappoint, uh, to not be concerned if uh, the choices, if, if when he acts on the decisions that he's made, the sort of the values that he's developed, um, that uh, not to care that, that people are going to um, disapprove. I mean, you know, we all know the guy um, who just is helpful to, you know, everybody. And there, there's a bit of that in all of us. And, you know, if, if you ask somebody, oh, Jack, isn't he a great guy? And they say, yeah, he's, he's, he's such, so helpful and he's so nice to have around. He's such great fun. And um, do you respect him? Um, well, yeah, well, no, I mean, he's a great guy, you know. Um, and you can see the you see girls having that conversation about that guy. And he's just been buffeted around. He's constantly trying to please everybody. He's constantly trying to seek approval, you know, just as people who have a thousand friends on their Facebook page. They're, people are, I guess you mustn't be too um, critical, you know. It, 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 you know, people do want to be um, approved of. Um, but I think, you know, the quality that seems to be most attractive to attractive quality women in the world are this ability to hold course, this sort of stick ability. It's like, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, the, the President of the United States or a, you know, a, a, a bearded hell's angel who, you know, uh, leads an itinerant life carpet bagging across America, um, w you know, w w with his tent and his, you know, shotgun in the side saddle. You know, it it's like they've both made uh, choices and they followed through on their choices. And in, by their, in their own terms, by their own terms, they have therefore succeeded as men on the world, in the world. And I think that, you know, we spend so much time in this twilight place of not really um, kind of figuring out and discovering who we really are and kind of nailing our colours to one particular mast as well. Because we're kind of trying to keep it, we're playing it safe, aren't we? We sort of want to keep our options open. But I mean, keeping your options open is like, I don't know, being on a merry-go-round. You're not really going anybody, anywhere, but your mind's going at some speed, but you're not actually getting any traction. It's like a car not being in gear, just the flywheels are spinning around endlessly and pointlessly. And that's not a bit of a, a, a dark, mechanical, kind of gothic kind of image, isn't it? But, that, but that's kind of not the place that the guy wants to live. A guy really wants to um, 
as I said in an earlier vlog, wants to polarise, not just in terms of romantic relationships with women, but also perhaps in terms of his, you know, philosophy of life and what it is that he stands for. And he doesn't want to be buffeted by um, peer approval. He doesn't want to be buffeted by uh, you know, the, 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 the things that his parents wanted him to do or didn't want him to do. Um, or he doesn't want to, you know, break his uh, alcohol fast just because his mate's trying to lean on him and persuade him to come down the pub for a few beers because they just want some company. They don't really care that um, it means him, you know, actually, you know, kind of a bit of a, a break of trust with themselves and they're going to have a little bit, a bit of a lack of self-respect from doing that, just a little. Um, so I think that that is, uh, now it, in terms of, you know, kind of applying this and thinking about it practically because, you know, I've, I have been ruminating on this. Um, I found this, this book as, as um, prompted some, you know, deep level thinkings about how I'm, I'm organising my life. I can think, you know, I can think of, you know, how feeling that I want to um, uh, keep everybody happy. Uh, I don't like the idea of being disapproved of, being hated by other members of the family, clear hatred coming for one um, part of my family. Uh, in, on, on the business front, you, I can think of just business decisions that I've made where I'm trying to please my business partner, for example, um, and uh, like giving people rope is another classic way, and just letting things go. Um, and you know, when you start to kind of think about it, and in the case of women, of course, letting yourself because you're feeling needy, which is fine, we all feel needy, but not actually seeing that she's just playing you for some affection, and, and the one itis situation, so you're just not prepared to go out and meet more girls. Um, and when you do, you discover, you wonder why, you're in a, you know, you were ever troubled about that one itis in the first place. You know, in all those sorts of areas of our lives, there are opportunities to disappoint people. Um, the, of course, you know, it's the fear. Um, it's the, uh, the fear of disappointment. It's the, the fear of loss of approval, which is perhaps at the heart of what it is to be a Mr. Nice Guy. We want everybody to love us. And the truth is, only your mother did, and perhaps even not then. Um, all right, so suck it up, bitches. A strap on your balls. I'm going to be uh, posting on a weekly basis the, the the top 50 hits of the vlogs that I've made over the last three or four years. Uh, I'm just going through all the vlogs that I, I pulled down after the nonsense that happened um, a, a couple of months ago. I'm just going through and it's been an opportunity to, to just uh, sort the wheat from the chaff and I'm now going to have a, um, on a weekly, but probably on a weekly basis, going to be um, putting up the my, my top hits, the best of Mr. Forrest, so stay tuned for that. Call me if you want to um, meet on Skype, I simply ask that you buy my books before we Skype, uh, to, keep, to keep, you, keep me going. And uh, yeah, um, in these str str rather strange times that we live in, look at it as, as a, something of an opportunity to, you know, consider and reflect more deeply about these issues. So you, that when you do go back into the world and take action, uh, you've got really sort of strong foundations in terms of your values, your boundaries, and your philosophies, uh, your philosophy of life, uh, um, and the, the trajectory that you chosen your life to take from which you'll not waver without good reason um, so yeah stay tuned guys that's all for today